Okay, biology students, we're on the last video for lecture 17. Here we're going to discuss members of the kingdom fungi or fungi. Any fun guys out there? What about fun gals? Any fun gals out there? Okay, so last time we talked about that this slide, my opening slide, only has one member of the kingdom fungi. Mushrooms. So who are these guys? That's an amoeba, a protist, an animal-like protist. Who's this guy? Paramecium, also an animal-like protist, also known as protozoan. So that was from the last lecture. In this lecture, we're going to describe the fungi. So there are three general categories of fungi. Mushrooms. Molds. And yeast. General characteristics. So they're all heterotrophic decomposers. They are not photosynthetic. They feed on organic material on other cells. A cell wall is present in members of the kingdom fungi. It's composed of a polysaccharide called chitin. It's pronounced chitin. So some uh, fung fungi are multicellular, so molds and mushrooms are multicellular. Unicellular, those would be the yeast. Okay, we'll also look at their methods of reproduction. Most of them reproduce asexually although there are some that reproduce sexually. I like to start with a little slide I call TGFF. Thank goodness for fungi. So, what wonderful things do we owe gratitude to the fungi for? Owed to the fungi. That's right, wine and beer and bread. What fungi do we, do we sing the praisers of here for providing us with the fermentation process that gives rise to wine, beer, and bread? That's right, this would be yeast. From molds, we get blue cheese, one of the only types of cheese you eat where it purposely has grown mold and you want that mold for the characteristic flavor of blue cheese. Also, penicillin and many other antibiotics are derived from molds. The first antibiotic ever used was actually penicillin and it was discovered on accident by a British microbiologist, his name was Alexander Fleming, who accidentally grew mold on Petri dishes in his lab and noticed that the mold killed bacteria on the Petri dishes. And he figured out that many molds and many microorganisms secrete chemical substances as a type of warfare at the microbial level. And he used penicillin, um, the first time penicillin was mass produced and used was in World War II, and is estimated to have saved about 40 million lives. So thanks to molds, we have antibiotics and blue cheese. From mushrooms, well, a pizza is not a pizza without mushrooms. 
Now we're going to go through each of the three body uh, structures of fungi and we'll describe some of their key features. So we'll start with the molds. Molds are filamentous, so they're composed of long strands of a uh, sort of stalk like or what we call filamentous like structures that uh, we call actually we call those hyphae so let's write that on the slide so what we're looking at in this picture is we're looking at some molds under the microscope because obviously when you see mold growing um, and I'm sure you've seen mold growing, but if you haven't seen mold growing, we need to take a look at that together. Let's actually do that. I have a great time lapse to show you. Okay, so now I found this time lapse of the mold rhizopus on strawberries. Now it's been time lapse, so you see this fuzzy, cottony, growth of this mold on the strawberries and look what it's doing to those strawberries it's liquefying them and then you see these little sprouts that start to form and most everybody's seen mold growing at home on you know your food items or on spaghetti dinner from two weeks ago and tupperware in the back of your refrigerator i know it's not just me some of you do the same right two weeks old old uh, spaghetti dinner, you open it up, it's full of all this fuzzy mold. So most people would describe this as fuzzy. So now you're going to learn the more technical terminology for fuzzy. Okay, so back to this slide. And so, yes, you can see molds without a microscope. Obviously, it's that fuzzy material that forms on bread or on cheese or on other objects and food items as well. So under the microscope, though, what do we call those filamentous structures? You could see here, let's outline some of them in this bread mold here and you see all these little these little filaments here. This structure is called hyphae. So this would be the filamentous cells. Okay, and so these hyphae, they have these little structures on the ends of the hyphae. Now these little structures can vary depend on the species of mold. So this is rhizopus here known as commonly as bread mold. And these little pods almost look like little little balls or little pods on the ends of these hyphae. These are called sporangia. So this structure is called a sporangia. And the sporangia actually contains the spores of this mold. So how do molds get established on food items in your kitchen? When you see mold growing in your kitchen or even on items that have been refrigerated, now usually that's after several weeks, right, of being refrigerated, um, you open it up and you find this, this uh, fuzzy mold growing. Um, so how does it get established? Well, it gets established by spores. Spores are microscopic. They're in the air. They also travel by water. And the spores will land and they will germinate is the word. It's actually a similar terminology to plants. So back in the old days, actually, fungi and plants were in the same kingdom. That gives you an idea of how things change in the field of taxonomy, of how uh, classification is done in biology. So back in the dark ages, they put these two groups together because there's a lot of terminology regarding the fungi that reminds people of plants. 
So similar to how seeds can germinate and produce new plants, so spores can germinate and produce new molds, and they germinate and create new uh, hyphae structures. Now the mold on the left, this is, this is the famous mold that produces penicillin, the antibiotic. It's called penicillium. And under the microscope, the sporangia for penicillium looks very different than the sporangium for rhizopus. It looks a lot like a little flower, doesn't it? But it's also just another form of sporangia. This type of sporangia has spores on the outside. Rhizopus actually does form like a ball-like structure with its sporangia, and the spores are inside. Penicillium has the spores on the outside, and actually in this microscopic view, you'll, you'll see all these little dots all over the slide. Those are spores that have been released from the sporangia of the penicillium mold. So it's possible to, to get different what we call morphologies or shapes to the sporangia of molds under the microscope. We would consider this method of reproduction primarily, although there are some exceptions, but primarily we would consider this a method of asexual reproduction. In other words, the spores are genetically identical, and when a spore lands on a new food source, it germinates and reproduces the mold, creating identical cells that are genetically the same as the original mold that made that spore. Okay, let's take a look now at the second form that, that fungi take the mushroom form. We use a lot of the same terminology that we use for molds. So mushrooms are also multicellular. It's why you can physically see, see it. Okay, usually multicellular organisms like yourself, um, those are easy to see because the cells group together into tissues or systems that make it visible to the naked eye. So obviously we can see mushrooms growing, especially when there's been a good rain outside. You'll often see these mushrooms sprout out. And a lot of times they sprout in little groups. So there'll be little, little rings of mushrooms in really close proximity to each other. And that's because mushrooms, they also reproduce by spores. So the spores are found on the under, underside of what we call the cap. So the next time you're cutting a mushroom in the kitchen, take a look at its structure. And so we call the cap um, the top part. And then you have these little flaps that are underneath the cap. We actually call them gills. And it's not for breathing, <laughs> okay? So it's not for breathing, um, not like fish gills. Okay, that just happens just happens to be the same word we use for fish gills. Okay, guys. Um, no, the purpose of the gills, this is actually where the spores are produced. So the spores are produced here in the gills. Obviously, in order to see spores, just like seeing mold spores, you would need a microscope. So these spores travel by wind or they travel by water. The microscope lab that we usually do here with the kingdom fungi, you look at the gills of the mushroom, these little flaps of the mushroom under the microscope, and we look for these little red structures called basidiospores. You don't really need to know the term basidio, but the term spore, you should definitely realize that the gills uh, the little flaps underneath the cap of the mushroom um, contain the spore producing structures. And then what you're seeing in this diagram, well, you're seeing all of these hyphae. Okay, so we, we also use the word hyphae for mushrooms as the filamentous cells. So all these filaments or the body of the mushroom is composed of these hyphae. Now, a lot of these hyphae go underground and act sort of root-like 
another sort of similar plant term, although once again, they're not plants, but um, it's very root-like. This, this underground hyphae here is very root-like. This is referred to as mycelium. So the underground root-like hyphae we call the mycelium. And then the mycelium also branches up into the the what you what you think about when you think of a mushroom, which is the cap and the stalk, which you could see here in the diagram is referred to as the fruiting body. Okay, so the 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 above ground part of the mushroom is referred to as the fruiting body. Again, another plant-like term. Although it's not making fruit, is it? No, the mushroom's not making fruit. It's making spores. So that's why it pushes this fruiting body structure to above ground so that it can make spores, drop the spores, and then new mushrooms will grow. But a lot of times that's why you see mushrooms in close proximity to each other because they drop their spores and then germinate into new mushrooms nearby. So most of the time we refer to this also as asexual reproduction, although this can this can lead to sexual reproduction where the spores are produced as a result of meiosis. So it does get a little bit complicated. Um, we look at it in the lab portion of this course but just realize that either asexual or sexual reproduction for the spore production. Sexual reproduction, again, the advantage would be genetic diversity of the spores, so producing more genetically unique spores, as opposed to asexually reproducing mushrooms that, that just reproduce by mitosis, making their spores by mitosis, that would create identical mushrooms. What is the largest living organism on Earth? Is it the giant sequoia tree? Have you ever been to Sequoia National Park and seen those huge giant redwoods? No, it's not the giant sequoia. Is it the blue whale? It's a pretty big whale. No, it's not the blue whale. Type it into Google, see what you get. You could pause the video. I'll be here. I'm not going anywhere. Did you type it into Google or did you just wait to see what I would do? Fair enough. Yeah, I copied and pasted it for you. Type it into Google, largest organism on earth, and what do you find? It's a fungus. It's a mushroom. Why is it the largest? Here I'm looking at the fruiting body component of this mushroom, which is nicknamed the humongous fungus. Um, so that's not what they're talking about. They're not talking about the fruiting body portion as being the largest uh, organism on earth. What they're talking about is all that mycelium, all the underground network, that root-like hyphae called mycelium that stretches here, it's telling us 2,385 acres or almost four square miles. So the largest living organism on earth is not the blue whale, it's not the um, giant sequoia, it's the humongous fungus. Fun fact of the day. On to the third type of fungus, yeast. This one stands out because it's the only type of fungus that is unicellular, single-celled uh, fungus that has sort of an oval shape under the microscope. Once again, to see the cellular structure of yeast, you're gonna need a microscope to do that, okay? And of course, yeast 
are significant to the food industry, the food and beverage industry, of course, because of the fermentation process, they could take sugar and turn it into gold. I mean, alcohol. <laughs> yeah, so pretty cool. How do they reproduce? Let's take a look. Let's go under the microscope. Let's watch these guys. Time lapsed. They look sort of like little bubbles, but um, that's the yeast. Now what we're looking for is we're looking for a process called budding. What that means, I love this part here. We can really zoom in. Do you see that? Isn't that cool? It's just, it's reproducing by making an identical copy of itself called a bud that grows off the side of the cell and then breaks off. Yeah, it's a lot like mitosis. The difference is that the cells that form, it does sort of this unequal division of the cytoplasm. And mitosis, it's equal division when that cell divides. Here, it starts as a tiny structure called a, this, the identical cell it's making here. Um, it starts smaller. That's why we call it a bud. So it's called budding. So this little bud here, break, branching off or growing off of the original parent cell. So we would have this be our parent cell. And then this would be the asexual bud. It's an identical clone of the parent. If this happened in you, it'd be like one day you get this tumor and it's growing off of your back and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, oh my gosh, this tumor, it has a face and it's your face and it keeps growing and it gets bigger and bigger. And then there's an arm that comes out. Eventually, <laughs> okay, I've been talking to myself for too long for too many days okay it's getting ridiculous <laughs> okay i'm okay now really okay so that's budding unique to the yeast oh let's leave you with some pathogenic fungi just to put the icing on the cake here so fungi, we've talked about beneficial fungi today. Thank you, TGFF, remember? Thank goodness for fungi. Um, but there's a little caveat to that story. And that is most microorganisms, there is a bad group, usually in small quantity, so not the majority, okay? but there are pathogens. And that word pathogen means disease causing. Okay, so common in bacteria as well as in fungi um, pathogens. So these are fungi can be pathogenic on plants, parasitic on plants or parasitic on animals. Let's see what I came up with here. Oh yes, athlete's foot caused by a parasitic mold. Ooh, anybody know what this is? Thrush. White patches that form on the inside of the mouth, mucosa. This is caused by a yeast infection. Okay, athlete's foot, foot is caused by a mold. Plant pathogen. Okay, this plant pathogen is called ergot. It's a fungus that grows on rye plants. And ergot is a natural source of LSD, the hallucinogenic compound LSD. It's a hallucinogen. There are also hallucinogenic compounds that are produced by certain mushrooms, known as psychedelic mushrooms, that also have a physiological interactions with the brain that cause um, 
people to go into sort of a trance-like state. Now, here's an interesting history lesson for you, those of you who know your American history. Do you know about the Salem witch trials? Very famous in Salem, in the, in the city of Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, it's estimated that hundreds of women were burned at the stake as supposed witches in the 17th century. Now, this is why science rules, okay? So there was a scientific explanation for why these women actually contracted this uh, actually disease. So they could they the evidence suggests they actually were poisoned by ergot. So if you ingest rye bread that's contaminated with ergot, you develop a disease called ergotism which can make you have, um, uh, you can hallucinate and have visions and think that you are a witch, perhaps. So that is the scientific explanation for that phenomenon. Anyways, I hope that was interesting and we'll talk to you next week. Bye for now.